Amen. So glad you're here. Thanks, Bryson and Carrie and the team for leading us in worship. If you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter 15 and 16 is where we'll be this morning. Go ahead and turn there. I'd love to read the passage that we're going to look at today. It'll be on the screen behind me as well. So uh, invite you to follow along either in your Bible or on the screen behind me. Let's read together as we start this morning. It says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what happened to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast in his image, and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, plagues clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. That was Revelation 15, 1 through 6. Sorry if I didn't give you that reference before we started. Jump to chapter 16, verse, starting with verse 17. It says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about a pound, a hundred pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plagues of the hail, because the plague was so severe. Father, we are um, reminded when we read passages like this of a day that is coming where your justice and your holiness and your wrath will be poured out. Uh, we've been studying in Revelation that has been evident that there is a day approaching with those, when those who have been opposing you will be judged and those who are sealed in Christ will stand. And this is a picture in Revelation chapter 15 and then I'm 16 of that day when it is finished, when it is done, when there is nothing after. Your wrath is poured out. Your judgment is complete. My prayer this morning is that as we read a passage like this, yeah, it would cause us, as Steve said earlier, to examine ourselves. We should do that always when we read Scripture. And it would cause us to ask a couple of questions. Am I prepared for that day? And if I'm not, what do I need to do to be prepared? And also, the other questions would be, thank you, God, that you are uh, in me and I am in you. And on that day, I can stand. And what things do I need to do to make sure to examine myself, to persevere to the end, to continue, as James says, to work out our salvation? Those things should be made evident to us as we study passages like this. I pray that if our minds and our eyes and our hearts are closed to those truths and others today as we study your word, you would open them and you would allow us to see. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Steve alluded to this. The time change can be rough, especially the one where we lose an hour instead of gain an hour. None of us like really to lose the hour, if you can term it that. I'm not sure you really lose an hour, but we know what we're saying when we say lose an hour. The opportunity to go to bed an hour early without excuse, I embrace. I'm, not, I'm okay with. I'm fine with. That's how I view that time change, that I get, an extra, I get to go to bed an extra hour early and prepare for the next day. I'm usually one who doesn't need much encouragement to do that. For others, the imminent arrival of the alarm one hour earlier really has no impact on your life, and it may have, in, in fact, impacted your attendance or others' attendance in church today because you didn't plan for that extra or that hour that you're going to lose as you woke up this morning. It has no impact. It didn't change your routine the night before. 
The fact that you lose an hour tomorrow does little, if anything, to change your pattern of life or routine today, even though you know it's coming, even though it's imminent. It's right around the corner. Tomorrow's reality does nothing to change today's routine. Now, when we look at a passage like this in Revelation, here's how I want to connect that. The message of Revelation is this. A new eternal reality is coming. And it would be a good idea if you and I made the necessary changes to prepare if we're not ready. It is just like the next day when you lose an hour. It is going to happen. Revelation gives us, through John's vision, clear a clear picture of that day that is coming. In Revelation 15 and 16, what we come to is the last of three sets of judgments throughout Revelation. And it shows us the end of all things. This is the complete destruction of all things, God's wrath being fully poured out on those who oppose him. So as we get into these judgments, these seven what is called the bold judgments of Revelation 15 and 16, how are we to understand them? What are they saying to us? I've quoted Alexander Stewart quite a bit through this. He's got a helpful book on Revelation, and I'll say this. This is what he says about these seven bowls. The seven bowls further describe God's judgment of the world. They conclude with the final battle and highlight the theme of, of God's justice. That's what the seven bowls help us understand. God's justice, God's wrath being poured out and bringing all of history to an end. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go through the time this morning, but they're going to show us two realities, and they'll be your two points for this morning, of the completed plan of God for human history, and they are realized in Christ. They are realized in Jesus. The two realities of this completed plan of God for human history, realized in Jesus are these. I'll just tell them to you now, and then we'll come back to them. Jesus first is the fulfillment of God's justice. We're going to see that in this passage. And then secondly, Jesus is the fulfillment of God's deliverance. Those two things will give us our framework as we work through the bold judgments in Revelation 15 and 16. What I'd like to do before we get there Because I think it's important as your pastor, as one who's been leading you for the most part through the book of Revelation, is to digress a little bit. Because I've had many of you catch me here in my office, call me on the phone, uh, send me a text, text and ask me something like this. Am I going to make it to the end? Is it, am I going to be one of the ones counted on that day who stands in Christ? Or... Am I going to be one of the ones who gets deceived by the beast, gets the mark, gets pulled away, and would be counted on that day with the beast, which would mean eternal destruction? Many of you have come to me and said, hey, I'm fearful. I'm worried that because of some some things going on in my life or some past things that I've done or or even present sins that I can't overcome, that those that means that I'm not going to make it to the end. And here's what I and I've told those of you who've asked me this, here's what I want to say to you. Those are good things to do, as Steve said earlier, to examine your heart when you come to Scripture. That's exactly what Scripture wants us to do. God, through his spirit, the scripture wants us to read his word and to allow it to shed light on our hearts and to examine ourselves. So you should do that. You should never come to God's word. We should never come to God's word and study God's word and think, oh, that's for somebody else. It has no impact on me. There's no, there, there's no reality in that passage for me. It doesn't, it, it's not relevant to me at all. We should always come to God's word and be prepared to examine ourselves. What I want to do for just a minute, and I don't, I don't really have a minute, uh, but I'm going to take it because I think this is important is to give a little bit of a theological, really a biblical understanding, an underpinning of this thing that we called perseverance of the saints. Some of you may understand that as once saved, always saved. That may be how you were raised in understanding it. It, it, It's the way I was raised in understanding it. Once saved, always saved. In other words, when I made a decision for Jesus, whenever that was, because I made a decision for Jesus, I'm going to be okay in the end. When Revelation 15 and 16 do occur, I'll be okay. 
Because I've made a decision, once saved, always saved, perseverance of the saints. So let me give you a couple of things to think about when it comes to that, and then we'll jump into our outline really quickly. But again, I think it's really important as you study Revelation to affirm some of these things. First, I want to say this, that those who are in Christ will persevere. In other words, let me, let me help you understand that. Those who are in Christ will make it to the end without walking away from their faith. Without abandoning their faith throughout their life. They will stay in Christ, not perfect. There will be times where you will have great days and great seasons with him. And there will be times where you fail him miserably. But in the end, he is working in your life. You have a desire to know him. And those who are in him will not walk away or abandon their faith. That's what it means when we talk about persevering in Christ. Not, not just when we talk about it, when Scripture talks about it. I'm going to give you a couple of passages here in a minute. Those who make it to the end, you could also say it this way, without abandoning their faith, without walking away from their faith, are those who are in Christ. You may have family members. You may have friends. They may be with you this morning. Don't nudge them. Don't elbow them when we're talking through this. That may be a burden on your heart. I have family members who this would hit because there is nothing in their life, I'll just say it this way to be as clear as I can be, there is no evidence in their life other than a decision they made when they were nine years old that they are in Christ now that they're in their 60s or 70s. Nothing's changed. No fruit is evident lovingly let me just say this to you there is no description of a christ follower in scripture that looks like that of someone who has made a decision but yet there's no fruit in their life there's no even desire in their life to follow after christ that's not a biblical picture of christianity that's not the gospel and if that causes you even where you are this morning to begin to examine your own heart here's what i want you to hear me say good examine it Look at it. Search the scriptures. Those who make it to the end without abandoning their faith are those who are in Christ. Two passages that give both of these uh, truths that I think we should hold to and, and have a balance in. The first one is John 10, when Jesus is speaking to his disciples. You know this passage. You may not know that reference, but this is the passage. My sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and Jesus says, and I know them. That's the verse, and that's the passage where he goes on to say, no one then will snatch them out of my hand. My sheep hear my voice, know my voice, and I know them, and no one is going to snatch them out of my hand. That's a bedrock foundational understanding and passage of eternal security, someone who's in Christ, and they will not be taken away from that. They've made that decision. And it's a genuine decision. That's John 10. On the other side of that, where we have to keep the balance is this, Hebrews 3, where it says, take care, my brothers and sisters, those who claim to be Christ followers. That's who he's talking to. Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to, to fall away from the living God. Hebrews is clear that there will be those, and Matthew 25 and other passages speak to this, on that day, who think because of something they have done that they are okay and they're in Christ and they will make it to the end in eternity with, with Christ. And that is not what, pa what the passage speaks to. That's not the truth of God's word. What God, God's word says is those who are in me know my voice, hear my voice, follow me, and I know them. And there is evidence in their life of that reality. And the other part of that is true, that do all that you can to examine your heart so that you will not fall away from Christ. It's not, a, I made a decision and I'm done until eternity. It's a continual walk and development in Christ. That's what the gospel says about someone who's a Christ follower. Let me say this really quickly and jump right into the two points. How do we hold tightly to both of these truths? By understanding that it is actually as we persevere through the Spirit's power that God continues his work of salvation in us. As you strive and as you work and as you examine, that is a means of grace in your life where God is at work. Otherwise, you would have no desire to examine yourself. You would have no second thought about those things that you're in that dishonor Christ. Christ. You would walk away from him and there would not be a second thought. The very fact that you are considering it 
should be a reminder to you and an affirmation to you that you're in Christ. Also, if you find yourself believing that once saved, always saved means you don't have to obey God's commands, they don't apply to you, or that you don't have to heed Scripture's warning, that doesn't apply to you. If that's your understanding of once saved, always saved, that is not Christian assurance. Let me just say that to you this morning. That's not Christian assurance. There will be struggles, yes, but cling tightly to these things if you are struggling with that this morning, and then I'll move on. Cling tightly to the truths of God's word. Stay in it. Don't wander from God's word or his truth. Stay in it. Secondly, quiet your mind and heart in consistent prayer before him. Be in communion with God on a consistent basis. And then third, surround yourself with others in the community of faith, the church. Don't isolate. Stay with the community of faith. Those things allow us to move forward in our walk with Christ. God has worked to bring you to salvation, Ephesians 2, to bring me to salvation. God is working, Romans chapter 8, and God will complete his work, Philippians chapter 1. He who began a good work will complete it. That's the truth that we remain in, that we stand in. I digress. Let's get back to the focus for the morning, two realities of God's completed plan. First, Jesus is the fulfillment of God's justice. Verse 5, verses 5 through 7 of chapter 16 say this, And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say this, Just are you a holy one who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. The judgments that are coming on the earth come from where? We don't attribute them to someone else. The angel here says they come from God himself. He brings these judgments. For they have, speaking of those who have stood in opposition to to God, they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. In other words, the wrath. Because of what they've done, they deserve. In other words, that's what the angel is saying. That's the vision John sees. Because of what they have done in opposing you, then they deserve the wrath that's coming their way. It is what they deserve. That's exactly what the angel says. And I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The seven bold judgments described by John as plagues Plagues, I keep saying plagues. Some of you may think, how's he saying that? Plagues, that's the, the Georgia uh, coming out of me, I guess. Plagues are modeled on the Egyptian plagues of Exodus and the five of the plagues that are directly parallel with the trumpet judgments of Revelation 8 through 11. If you've been with us, we've studied already two series of seven judgments, both seals and trumpets. Five of these here in the passage we study today of the bowls parallel directly to five of those that were in the trumpet judgments. Judgments. Now, the main difference are two, their intensity and their finality. So their intensity is this, they impact the whole world. If you remember, if you were here, uh, when we studied the seals, it was a quarter of the earth that was affected by the, by the judgments. When we studied the trumpets, it increased a little bit because it covered and impacted a third of the earth, if you remember that. When we get to the bowls, what is it? It's complete, the whole earth. Nothing can shy away or remove themselves from the judgment of God that is coming. The wrath of God that is being poured out. So they intensify in these final judgments that we see in the bowls. So that's the first difference. The second difference is their finality. As we read in 15, chapter 15, verse 1, in Revelation 16, 17, this is the end. That's what is said from the throne room, from Christ himself. It is done. The final judgment. When we get to 17 through 20, chapter 17 through 20, then we'll look at these final judgments a little bit closer and, and, and in specific detail. But the justice of God is fulfilled here. In other words, the kingdom has arrived. We talked about this over and over again through the series. That God, Christ instructs his disciples to pray, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done. That's the model prayer. The reason we pray that is because we pray and God's kingdom comes, and as it comes and as it gets here, it is in direct opposition to the kingdoms of the world built to oppose God and his rule. So the kingdom here in 1516 has arrived. This is the end. It's over. Jesus now asserts his earned and rightful authority and I love the movie The Equalizer. I don't need any emails about how bad of a movie or good of a movie that is. Just hear me out. I love a character in the movie called The Equalizer that says this. This is Jesus and his rule and authority. At this point, I have not come to ask permission, but to tell you what to do. 
Jesus in 15 and 16 has not come any longer to offer another opportunity. And certainly not to ask your permission. Not this time. When he came as a baby, that was offered. When he comes this time as king, it's over. Those who are standing in Christ will remain. Those who are in opposition to him will not be. Destruction is coming. That's what 15 and 16 describe for us. Hebrews chapter 2 says this, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, that's speaking of Christ, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, in redeeming many, that's what he's saying, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. In other words, Jesus lived a perfect life, but for God's plan to be completed, to be made perfect in him, what had to happen? He had to suffer. He had to go to the cross in order for you and I to be made right, to be justified, and to be able on that final day to stand before God. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source, Christ. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. And here's a big theological word for you. You can try to write this down and spell it. It's really going to be hard for me to even say, so I'm not going to say it often. Propitiation, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. I actually have to slow my mind down a little bit to actually say that word. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. Here's what that word means. Here's what that word means, right? Uh, I'll, I'll help you spell it afterwards if you need help spelling that. Here's what it means. To satisfy and turn away God's wrath. That's really what that word means. To satisfy and to turn away God's wrath. The Father's anger against sin is this. It's just. And because of Jesus, his acceptance now of sinners is also just. There had to be someone to take your place on the cross, to pay for your sins on the cross, to justify you and me. A sacrifice had to be made to turn away God's wrath. That's what Hebrews 2 is talking about. And there was only one person who was able to do that, Jesus. And guess who did it? He did it on the cross for you and has paid for those sins. In that sense, God's justice is made complete. So the truth here, and then we'll move to point two. Jesus demands a standard, or sorry, justice demands a standard only Jesus can meet. The justice of God demands a standard that only Jesus can meet, and the great news of the gospel is that he did meet it. He met the standard on the cross for you. Justice demands a universal standard that is immune to every accusation and every character assassination. Jesus, as the perfect substitute, paid the debt and turned away God's wrath, not for every person, but for every person who believes and trusts in him the wrath of god applied in light of the cross it's horrible it's justifiable it's sudden chapter 16 verse 15 in the passage that we're in says it comes like a thief unexpected but it will come it's also only after every opportunity to repent and turn every opportunity to hear the gospel and respond and that may be you this morning. You've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it. The gospel. I need Christ. I need to be in him. I'm trying to do it myself. I'm trying to work out my salvation my own way instead of trusting in Christ. An opportunity again this morning is here for you to turn and repent and believe in Christ. It's also just, verse 7 of chapter 16. True and righteous are your judgments, is what the angel says. Secondly, quickly, Jesus is also the fulfillment of God's deliverance. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's deliverance. Chapter 16, verse 17 and 9 through 19 it says, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. It's interesting. We'll talk about that and what that means in a minute. And a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying this, It is done. It's over. It's finished. And there were flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, great earthquakes such as there has never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split in three parts. The cities of the nations fell. God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine 
of the fury of his wrath. The seventh bowl is poured out, it says, into the air. Now that could refer to Ephesians 2, where the devil there, the enemy, is actually called the prince of the air. We don't know for sure, but that could be the final judgment of the ultimate enemy. Poured out wrath into the air. It's a picture of deliverance through destruction. And, and can I just say this to you really quick? That's the picture of the cross. That's the picture of the cross. Deliverance through destruction. A man giving his life, being destroyed for you. That's what that is. That's what we see in Revelation 15, 16. Deliverance through destruction. The final angel brings about the divine declaration of finality. He says it's done. That phrase shakes, it says, the heavens and the earth, and nothing can stand at that moment in opposition to God. Everything that still remains is completely destroyed at that point. The great city of Babylon, representative of every world power that has ever existed, and listen, this is key and important, in opposition to God. Those who are in Christ during this time stand confidently in him. I do not believe personally escape the moment where everything is shaken. I think we are absolutely a part of that. The difference in that is that we are able to stand when it is shaken. Where those who are against Christ in opposition to him cannot. Only those who are in Christ stand in that moment. You ever, you've heard the phrase, it's not over till it's over. All right, it's not over till it's over. I, uh, Carter, my son, and I were watching a ball game last night. It didn't turn out the way we'd wanted it to. I won't go into detail on that one. Big, big rivalry, but, you know, there, were time, there was time left. We were hoping. We were hoping, man, they'd make a comeback. And they tried, but didn't quite make it, right? So it, we, we had that belief that, man, it's not over till it's over. Or maybe I did. I don't know if Carter did at, at, at all, but I did. I, I had a belief, hey, it's, it's not over till it's over. We've all said that expression. We've, all, we've all also witnessed incredible comebacks. You've all watched sports events that you were in, and you saw your team make it all the way back and actually win. That expression gives voice to the belief that there is always a chance as long as there is time, right? There's always a chance as long as there is time. Here's what John's vision says to us. 15 and 16, the time is up. It's over. It's done. That moment is coming. Thankful this morning, hopefully you are, that you are in Christ. And whenever that moment comes, like a thief in the night unexpected, you are ready because you are in him. Not because of anything you have done, but by trusting in everything Christ has done, you stand in Christ. But there are many, maybe even some in the room this morning, who cannot confidently say that you stand in Christ. You'll have the opportunity in just a minute to respond to that, to say, I'll embrace that. I repent and turn back, and I want to be in Christ today. John's vision gives us the moment when it's finally over. So the truth here, and then we'll close, is final deliverance is accomplished when the enemy has been fully defeated. Final deliverance is accomplished when the enemy has been fully defeated. That's the picture we get in Revelation 15 and 16. Deliverance is the final removal of godless systems and powers. All of it's over. God designs the ultimate destruction of evil to initiate the deliverance of his people. That's the way he has designed it. He has made it that way. We have the great model of him doing that on the cross for you and I. And in that moment, on that day, for those who stand in Christ, their ultimate deliverance is fulfilled in Christ because they are in him. And when everything else is judged, they stand. When everything else is shaken, they stand. Colossians chapter 1, and you who once were alienated, hostile, doing evil deeds. Listen, here, has, here is what he has done for you. If you're here this morning and you are in Christ, if you are a Christian, and you're growing in your walk with him. Here has what, here's what he has done for you. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you what? Holy and blameless and above reproach before him. It's the only way you and I are getting there. We don't get there any other way. It's only through the blood of Christ and the sacrifice he made and my trust and faith in that, even on days 
as a pastor, I can say this to you, even on days when I don't get it right, and there are many days where that happens, if not every day, but my confidence is not in what I can do, but it is what he has done. That's where your confidence has to be, what Christ has done. Ephesians 2, that he might create in himself, listen, one new man in place of two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body. Listen, how? Through the cross. Thereby killing the hostility. Removing anything that would keep us away and apart from God. Christ has done that. This is a reminder that those seated in Christ will do this. They will share in Jesus' sufferings. You will share in Jesus' sufferings. Scripture's clear in that. It's not a gospel that says, hey, come to Christ and everything turns out great after that. That's not even reality. If you've walked for him, with him long enough, you know that's the case. I've come to Christ and things seem to get harder. Well, now you're a target by the, <laughs> to the enemy. It's going to get harder. You're going to share in the sufferings of Christ. If Christ had to go to the cross, we will share in those sufferings. That's true of you and I, but also the second thing is true. We will stand in him after the shaking. Once everything is shaken at the end, those in Christ will stand. Look how the writer of Hebrews picks up on that language. At that time, his voice shook the earth. This is speaking of what we just read about in Revelation 15 and 16. His voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake, listen, not only the earth, but also the heavens. Translation, everything in the universe. When I say those words will be shaken. Nothing will stand unless it's in Christ. Nothing remains unless they're in him. This phrase yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have, that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. That's you and I in Christ. Once that happens, those who are in Christ, we will remain. That's the promise of Hebrews 12. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom. Boy, what, a, what an encouraging word for you and I. That cannot be shaken. Isn't that great news? I don't know about that. That's great news for me. That I'm a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. But look at, because there's coming a day when everything will be shaken. And unless it's the kingdom of God and those in Christ, it will not remain. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Listen, for our God is a what? Is a consuming fire. If you want to stand on that day after the shaking... Make sure you are in Christ. Consider it today. Jesus is the fulfillment of all God's plans. A hundred years from now, none of us will be here. Likely, all of us will be forgotten by those who were alive in 21, 24. That's, that's where we'll be in a hundred years, 21, 24. Someone else will enjoy the house you built. More than likely, the company you've given your life to will be no more. Eventually, even your own family won't really remember your name. You think, well, that's kind of harsh, Pastor. Well, let me ask you this. Do you know the, the name of your grandfather's father? I don't. That's, that's not, surely that's not the hope that you have. Our hope has to be grounded in the reality that's coming. And that although this earth will pass away and nothing will remain, I'm found in him and I will not be shaken. I will remain. That's where my confidence is. This is the same one that said it is finished from the cross. That voice that said on the cross it is finished is the voice of Revelation 15 that says it is done. Right? It's the picture of completeness. He's finished it. It's over. And those who are in me, those sheep who hear my voice and I know them are mine and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So your response should be this. To repent of anything that does not square with Jesus Christ. To repent of anything that does not square with him. If there's anything in my life, if there's anything in your life that keeps you from remaining and staying and being in Christ, this morning the encouragement to you is to repent of all of that. Confess that. Come to Christ. Respond to him. It, it may not seem like it right now, but that day that's described in John 15 and 16 is coming. And it's coming quicker than you realize. My encouragement to you as if you're a pastor this morning is to heed the warning.
to be prepared and let your confidence come from, from being in Christ, not in your own works. Maybe that needs to be you this morning. If so, I pray you would respond to that. His offer remains. The gospel is available to you to be made right before Christ, removing all hostility. Respond to him this morning. Father, I, I do thank you for the, the, the word that we get when we read this and the feeling that probably many of us get, man, that's scary. I don't even want to think about that. That is hard, and that, th that is true. I don't, I don't disregard that. But what it should cause us to do in this room this morning who are under the sound of the truth of the word is to do this, is to be encouraged that, yes, we know we're in Christ and no matter what comes on that day, we are prepared. When everything is shaken, we will stand. And if, that's the, if, if, if for that group in the room this morning, God, let that be an encouragement to them to, to continue on, to, to push forward because that day is coming. For those in the room today who have no confidence that if it happened even today that they would be able to stand against all of that, my prayer is that you would draw them even this morning to reach out to you and embrace Christ. That the gospel would change them and they would respond. Those are the two responses. Those are the two reactions. God, work in hearts this morning during this time. In Jesus' name I pray.